In this presentation, I will uh, give a few examples of meta-analysis I've been done personally with my group and many other people. What we've done in the past uh, year, since 2007, is that we, that we collect all the that we collect all the published randomized trials on psychological treatments for adult depression. And what I will do in this presentation, I will show you the results of a series of meta-analysis we've been doing on that subject. So what I will do is I will first briefly show why depression is such an important issue. Then I will briefly cover how we did the methods for these meta-analysis. And I will, then I will show the results of it and I will talk about the effects of different psychotherapies, comparison with pharmacotherapies and combined treatments, the effects in different target groups, what do we know about the characteristics of the therapies, uh, do they only uh, have effects on depression or also on other outcomes. But I will also again show you briefly the problems with publication bias and quality of uh, the randomized trials. And then uh, finally I will sh say something about new directions we're currently taking in this whole field of meta-analysis. So first, depression. Well, depression is a worldwide public health problem and one of the largest one. It's always, since, uh, since uh, this has been measured, depression is somewhere in the top four of disorders with the highest disease burden worldwide in terms of disability adjusted life years. And if you, if you look at how that's, how that's developing over time, depression is expected to have the highest disease burden in developed countries by 2030. And that's um, uh, the problem there is that it's, if you have a depression, it's, it has of course an enormous impact on your personal suffering and uh, the suffering from people uh, around you. Um, but the, what, is, what is making it such a highly important issue from a public health perspective is that it's also so very common. So many people have it. In the Netherlands, about 7% of the adult population has had a depressive disorder in the past year. And that's, that's very much. So if you combine that high prevalence with a high level of personal suffering, it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, the disease burden uh, compared with all other dis diseases is so high for depressive disorders. And we, it's not only the high prevalence, but also the high incidence, the large numbers of new people every year who develop a major depressive disorder, and the huge economic costs which are involved in, uh, which are caused by depressive disorders, by healthcare costs, but even more in production losses, because people don't go to work, or if they go to work, that are not as productive as they were. Um, uh, when they were not depressed. So, from a public health perspective, depression is one of the major challenges for the next decades. If we want to do something about depressive disorders, psychological treatments are very important. And I will, I will as I said, I will uh, summarize what we know about the effects of psychological treatments from research that has been done in the past four decades. So I, I won't go into the deta details about the methods we've used because in this course I have explained the methods uh, that, that have been used across these meta-analysis. Um, um, so it's, but I won't go into all the details on heterogeneity and all the subgroup analysis we did. So I, because that's far too much uh, with what we did. And I will only summarize the main results of what we did in that series of meta-analysis. We have given uh, the, the methods, we have written that down in a methods paper in 2008. We have given an overview of the results in, a t a couple of, in, in 2011, which should be updated now, but we haven't done that yet. And we have also opened up the data collected in this, 
uh, in this whole project so other researchers can just download the data and uh, do the analysis themselves. We did exclude some studies, so we did not look at adolescents and children, only at adults. We also mainly look at the short-term effects, and we have excluded maintenance treatments. So it's, um, uh, it's quite a narrow uh, view on the effects of psychotherapies. It's not something I've done alone. There are dozens of other people who have been involved in this, and here's a list of the most important people who have been involved. So, as I said, we have been collecting these data since 2007, and every year we update the searches. So we, every year we see which new studies have been done, and we add them to the database. Up to now, we have, um, uh, we have included studies up to January the 1st from 2013. We are updating it now for later years, but we have not yet finished that. So, so I will present the results as they are at that moment, January 1, 2013. And as you can see in this list, is that we have included all kinds of comparisons. So we, 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 in some studies, psychotherapies are compared to control groups. In other studies, psychotherapies are controlled to other psychotherapies. They can be con compared to pharmacotherapy, to combined therapy, uh, pharmacotherapy versus combined therapy. Uh, you can, we have studies on inpatients. We have studies comparing individual with group therapy, face-to-face -face and guided self-help, et cetera, et cetera. So we have all kinds of comparisons available in this whole set of 350 included studies. If you look over time, what you see here is that um, until about 1995, most research was done in the United States. Since then, the number of trials in Europe has increased uh, considerably. And between two, 2006 and 2010, more trials were done in Europe than in the United States. What we also see is that the number of trials in other countries increases considerably, and that's not only Australia and Canada and Western countries, but also in countries in Africa, South and East Asia, South America. So what we see is that the number of trials uh, is increasing, and that's a worldwide movement. And so we will first have a look at the effects of different psychotherapies. Um, as I said in the, as I have explained in the, uh, uh, in the, during the course, is that we, we, we can look at effect sizes, but they are very difficult to interpret for patients and clinicians. So I have given here also what, what, what we said, the numbers needed to be treated. How many patients do you need to have one more additional out, good outcome compared to no treatment or compared to another treatment. So what you see here is that you see different types of uh, psychotherapies, cognitive behavioral therapy, behavioral activation, interpersonal psychotherapy, psychodynamic problem solving therapy. And if you look at the effect sizes, they are, they are not so very different from each other it seems that all therapies are about equally effective. And we have done meta-analysis of most of these individual therapies. So we haven't done a specific one on CBT and a specific one on behavioral activation. Um, um, uh, so what, basically what these uh, uh, meta-analysis show is that the effect sizes are somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8 indicating quite good effects of psychotherapy compared to control groups, care as usual, waiting list, placebo. The other question is, if these uh, therapies are all ab about equally effective, maybe it's better to look at studies in which patients are randomized to one of those treatments. And then after that trial, we can see uh, if patients who were randomized to CBT have a better outcome than patients randomized to IPT. So those direct comparisons are much better 
equipped to examine whether there are true differences between psychotherapies. And what we see is that here you see a study we did in uh, 2008 and published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology. If you look at those direct comparisons between psychotherapies, we find no or very small differences between therapies. There, most of the research has been done on cognitive behavioral therapy, but if you look at the studies, there's no indication that CBT is better than other psychotherapies. We did find that interpersonal psychotherapy may be somewhat more effective than other psychotherapies, but in a later meta-analysis we published in 2011 in the American Journal of Psychiatry, we could not replicate that. So there we did not find that IPT was more effective than other psychotherapies. We also found that non-directive supportive counseling was a little less effective than other psychotherapies, and, but I will come back to that. Um, last, in 2013, we did a network meta-analysis of almost 200 randomized trials on psychotherapy with a Swiss group, and so there the, the, the outcomes were very much the same. No significant differences between types of psychotherapy for adult depression. In one of the meta-analyses, we focused on non-directive supportive counseling. And non-directive supportive counseling is that you are, you just do the basic therapy skills. You are empathic, you listen to your patient, you give feedback, you summarize what the patient says, but you do not do specific techniques like cognitive restructuring or behavioral activation or problem solving. You're just empathic, you're a good listener, you give feedback, etc. So we, there were quite a few studies on that, and we found uh, in total 31 studies uh, for this meta-analysis. And in most studies, counseling was used, was intended to be used as a control group. And, uh, but then in many studies it was found, well, it wasn't that much less effective than, other, than the other, the active, the real psychotherapy. So that was, that, was, uh, um, uh, that was quite a surprise. And if you look at the effect size compared to control groups, waiting list, care as usual, we found yet that, that the effects were quite good, 0.58, which is not, not very much worse than for, we find for other psychotherapies. What we did find is in direct comparisons with other psychotherapies, so if you compare uh, uh, counseling with interpersonal psychotherapy or with problem solving or whatever. In those comparisons, we found that it was somewhat less effective than other psychological treatments, which is in line with the earlier meta-analysis, which, which I showed previously. But if you only look, for example, at studies directly comparing counseling with CBT, that difference was not significant and very small. We also looked at researcher allegiance. Was the researcher convinced in advance that the alternative therapy was superior to non-directive counseling? And if we adjusted for that, then there was no significant difference. Uh, uh, there was no significant difference left. So, uh, Probably this shows that all psychological treatments which are well developed are about equally effective. Uh, but uh, how does that compare with pharmacotherapy and combined treatment? So if you, so I, I, if you focus on uh, the, the comparison, the direct comparisons between psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy, in the first meta-analysis we did, we found 37 studies. We found an indication that pharmacotherapy was, was a bit more effective than psychotherapy, but the dropout in psychotherapy was lower. And if you adjust for that, there was no difference between pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy. Uh, 
we repeated, we updated this meta-analysis uh, some, some time later, and we found that uh, we, we expanded this meta-analysis also to anxiety disorders, so not only depression, but also to anxiety disorders. And we found clear indications that psychotherapy is less effective in dysthymia, but it's more effective in obsessive compulsive disorder. And again, we found that counseling was less effective than pharmacotherapy, and that uh, tricyclic antidepressants are less effective than psychotherapies. And all of these findings remain significant in multivariate meta-regression analysis, in which we adjusted for all the characteristics of the studies, except for the stimia. I will come back to that later. So, it's the, this suggests that all treatments are equally effective. We know from all kinds of, we know from meta-analysis of different medications for depression that these medications are also about equally effective. So then we have all psychotherapies being equally effective, all pharmacotherapies being equally, equally effective, and psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy is equally effective. So that suggests that we can, uh, that all treatments are, whether it's psychological or pharmac pharmacological, that they, are in, that they are indeed equally effective. The problem here is that we do not know who benefits from which treatment. So we have no indication all treatments are equally effective, but we do not know who will benefit most from CBT or pharmacotherapy. And we're doing now an individual patient data meta-analysis in which we collect all the, tr the primary data from randomized trials, in, and we hope that we find moderators of outcome which can be used to identify those people who benefit from more from one treatment compared to another. But it's not completely true that all treatments are equally effective because combined treatment is definitely better than uh, uh, one either pharmacotherapy or psychotherapy alone. Here I've given the effect sizes of all therapies compared to pill placebo. So they, here you see the results of all uh, 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 meta-analysis in which the same control group is used, pill placebo. So we've, we know that for pharmacotherapy, the Cohen's D is 0.31. After adjustment for publication bias, we find the effect size for psychotherapy is 0.25, but the effect size for combined therapy is 0.52. So that's much better, much uh, more effective than pharmacotherapy alone or psychotherapy alone. So if you look at all the different comparisons you can make here, uh, this is what you find. Psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy are about equally effective. But if you compare psychotherapy with combined treatment or pharmacotherapy with combined treatment, the combined treatment definitely is more effective than either treatment alone. There is one interesting group of studies in which combined treatment, so psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy, is compared to psychotherapy plus pill placebo. And what those studies show is the exact contribution of the active medication to the effects of combined treatment. So we can uh, 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 exactly identify the, what, the, what the active medication contributes to combined treatment. And that's not so very big. It's an effect size of 0.25. If we would be able to do to, to make a design, comparable design to, uh, with uh, uh, psychotherapy, I'm absolutely certain that we would come up with the same small effect size for psychotherapy. There is one very interesting group of studies in depression and anxiety, so not only uh, uh, aimed at depression. We published this in World Psychiatry, Psychiatry in 2013. And in these 11 studies, they have pill placebo only, psychotherapy only, pharmacotherapy only, and a combined treatment. What you can see here is what uh, these studies 
allow to exactly examine what the contribution of each of these elements is to the final effect sizes. And what these, what these studies show is that it's, uh, that it's probably so that medication and psychotherapy are relatively independent of each other. So if you look at the results of combined treatments, which is 0.74, that is the sum of the effect of psychotherapy versus placebo plus pharmacotherapy versus placebo. So that suggests that the effects of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy may be relatively independent of each other, which would be good news for patients because then, uh, then you, could, uh, uh, you could use each of these medications depending on what the patient needs. We have to be very careful with this, uh, of course, because of the broad confidence intervals and because it's not limited to one type of disorder. But it's an intriguing thought that medication and psychotherapy work independently of each other. We have also looked at the long-term effects. Uh, we are, we are, we're, do, we're starting to do that. Most of our meta-analysis are only examining the short-term effects, but we have briefly looked at the long-term effects. And what we find there is that we, we found a group of studies in which cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, was given in the acute phase of depression. So only, you only get CBT. And during the year, the follow-up year, you get nothing or almost nothing. We could compare that to pharmacotherapy, which was given during the acute phase, so in the same period that the other patients received CBT, but also when that was continued over time. Um, so what we found there is that if you compare acute phase CBT without continuation with pharmacotherapy with a full year of continuation, that, that, was, that, that, that there was no significant difference, but there was a trend suggesting that CBT may be somewhat more effective than pharmacotherapy. But that was only a trend, so it was not really significant. But it clearly shows that there is no difference. So if you uh, have CBT and nothing during the year follow-up, it's as, at least as effective as taking medication and continuing to do that uh, for that year. If you stop taking medication during that follow-up year, there's no doubt that CBT is better. So the, the effect size uh, of the odds ratio of uh, a good outcome of, of CBT versus uh, pharmacotherapy, which is tapered during the follow-up year, that was 0.62, and that was highly significant. We've also looked at trials on maintenance therapy, maintenance and interpersonal psychotherapy. So you continue to give interpersonal uh, therapy uh, every month, every six weeks, every two months, one follow-up session. And we found there that um, we found clear indications that if you do that maintenance, uh, if you give patients maintenance IPT plus pharmacotherapy, that, that, that the relapse rate uh, is much lower than that you only give pharmacotherapy. And if you compare maintenance IPT with placebo to placebo alone, the effect size is also much better uh, for the maintenance IPT. Okay, I'll, I'll go to the next uh, subject. What about specific target groups? Most trials we work with uh, in this field are aimed at adults in general. So they are just, there, there are no further specification for that. But there are all kinds of studies aimed at specific target groups. So for example, there are 44 trials aimed at older adults who are 55 or 60 or older. And what we find there is that the effects of psychotherapies for these older adults are very comparable 
with those for, of younger adults. And we did a meta-regression analysis in which we compared the studies in older adults with those in younger adults, and we found no indication that there were differences in effect sizes. But uh, there is hardly any research in the older old people, 75 or 80 years and older. So we could, can't safely assume that psychotherapy is effective in adults up to 75, but after that we just do not have enough evidence. We also know that psychological treatments are effective in postpartum depression. We did one specific meta-analysis on that, and we found no indication that psychological treatments are less effective if you use them in women with postpartum depression. Same is true for people with general medical disorder, so people who have depression but also diabetes or also cancer or also a heart disease. There's no indication to assume that psychological treatments are less effective in these groups. When we talk to general practitioners about depression and the treatment of depression with psychotherapy, they often say, well, that may be true for patients you have in secondary in specialized mental health care, but the depressed patients we see are very different, and they are most patients never make it to specialized mental health care and are treated by the general practitioner in primary care. And they, um, so what we did is we did a meta-analysis of uh, uh, studies on psychotherapy for depressed patients who in primary care. So they had to come from primary care samples. Overall, we found an effect size which was indeed smaller than what we find in specialized mental health care. And the effect size was 0.31, which is considerably smaller than uh, from other studies. Here we did all kinds of subgroup analysis, so what moderators could, be, uh, could play a role here. And what we did find here is that if a patient is referred for depression and treatment by the general practitioner, that the effect size is 0.43, and that's not, not uh, systematically different from what we find from other psychological treatments. If, however, those patients are recruited by systematic screening of the whole sample of, of GP patients, there we found a sw small effect size which was not significant. So the conclusion here is that if a primary care patient with depression is referred for treatment by their GP, then there's no reason to assume that psychotherapy is less effective. If you start screening for it, then there are clear indications that psychotherapy is not effective. There is also a small group of studies looking at psychotherapy for inpatients, so patients admitted to psychiatric hospitals. What we found there is that the effect sizes found for psychotherapy are not that big, an effect size of 0.29, but you have to remember that the people in the control groups in these settings, they all get some kind of therapy with nurses, with uh, all kinds of people working in the psychiatric hospital. So that control group is very different from the control groups we find in other settings. So it's not so very surprising that the effect sizes are somewhat smaller in these studies. We've also looked at uh, studies examining psychotherapy for chronic depression and dysthymia. And here we also find a much smaller effect size than in other, than in other uh, patient samples. And we also found very clearly that pharmacotherapy is more effective than psychotherapy in, these, uh, in patients with chronic depression or is dysthymia. That may be driven by the fact that there are about five or six studies on dysthymia and they have very negative outcomes for psychotherapy. So this may be driven by dysthymia patients, but the number of studies is not so large and it, this could be an artifact, 
Uh, so it's, uh, we're not very certain about these uh, results, but up to then, up, up to the, until we have more research, the, co the conclusion must be that psychotherapy is less effective in chronic depression and dysthymia, uh, and that combined treatment is, is the best option here. I was, what I was here is uh, what you see is a meta, the results of a meta regression analysis. We calculated pre post effect sizes indicating the improvements in patients from baseline to post test. And we uh, made a regression analysis of the association between the effect size for each study and the number of psychotherapy sessions. And what you see in this figure is on the horizontal axis, you see the number of therapy sessions, and on the vertical axis you see the effect size, and the regression line go, uh, go through the figure. And what you see is that the effect size increases with an increasing number of sessions. Um, and what you, um, uh, what you can conclude here, we did all kinds of subgroup analysis as well, and what we found is that if you want to have a reasonable effect size, you have to have at least 18 sessions of psychotherapy, which does make sense uh, in this sample. In another group of studies, we looked at comorbid depression and alcohol problems. We had 15 studies. It was published in Addiction in 2013 and led by my colleague, Helene Rieper. And what we found is that effect sizes are smaller than in other studies. Uh, but we also found that these interventions have a small effect on alcohol use. So the effects are not as strong as in other uh, 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 psychotherapies on other types of depression, uh, but uh, we did... Uh, 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 there are effects and also on alcohol use. And we, here we found that at, at, a, at a longer term follow-up, between 6 and 12 months, the effects were still there and still significant. Then we have a group of studies focusing on subclinical depression. So that these are patients who do have some symptoms of depression, but do not meet full criteria for major depression or dysthymia. So there has to be a diagnostic interview to establish the fact that they do not meet criteria for major depression or dysthymia. And we, we found 18 studies with an effect size of 0.35, which is not as large as what we find for other studies. But that's not so strange because in these patients, they get, they, the, the symptoms are not that severe, so they have less room for improvement. So uh, uh, that's not, not that surprising. What we did find is that if you treat these patients, that the incidence of major depression, according to a di diagnostic interview, at 6 and 12 months was reduced. And that was significant at 6 months uh, follow-up with a relative risk of developing a major depressive disorder of 0.61, which was significant. In another type of analysis, we, ex we examined whether psychotherapy is only effective in patients with mild to moderate depression, which is often suggested also in treatment guidelines, that you should use psychotherapy only in mild to moderate depression. Well, we examined it. We did a meta-regression analysis in which we looked at baseline severity. We could not find an association between baseline severity and outcome. We also had a small number of studies in which high severe, severely depressed patients and uh, uh, patients with less severe depression were directly compared within these studies. And we, there we found that psychotherapy seems to have more effects, higher effects in the more severely depressed patient groups. So the suggestion that psychotherapy is less effective in more severe depression is not supported by these data. In another group of studies, we've looked at ethnic minorities. So we've looked at studies um, um, uh, uh, and examined whether the percentage of people, participants from ethnic minorities was associated 
with the outcome. And again, there was no indication of that. So that's, that's, uh, that is not very strong evidence, but the correlational evidence this gives uh, indicates that minority status is not a predictor of or moderator of outcome. The number of studies in uh, other countries outside Western countries is also increasing. So uh, one of my PhD students did a meta-analysis of these a couple of years ago, uh, not only on depression, but also on anxiety. We found 18 studies by then. The number has increased since then considerably. And what we find is that the effect sizes are quite high. And that's not so surprising because often these interventions are compared to care as usual. And care as usual in low and middle income countries usually means there's, that they get no treatment at all. So it's not surprising that the effect sizes are then somewhat larger. So what about the characteristics of these uh, therapies? What do we know? What, what characteristics are associated with the outcomes? Well, first we have looked at the format of therapy. And we've, we, have, we found uh, uh, a number of studies in which individual therapy and group therapy are directly compared with each other. And we found there that individual therapy was a little more effective than group therapy and that dropout was significantly higher in group therapy. However, the quality of this, these studies was not very high. So I, I'm not very certain whether this is really a valid outcome. And I, I wouldn't dare to say now that individual treatment is better than group therapy. The evidence is not just not good enough to make that conclusion. What about internet-based therapy? So we did find that internet-based therapies, uh, usually based on cognitive behavioral therapy, are effective. I told you in the course already that if you have supported internet therapy with a coach or a therapist to help you through the intervention, that has large effects which are not very different from face-to-face um, -face therapies. But if you have no support, so if you have to work through it all alone, then the effects are significant but, but considerably smaller. There are also studies in which guided self-help and face-to-face -face therapies for depression and anxiety are directly compared with each other and they find no difference, no significant difference between guided self-help and face-to-face -face therapy. And this has been confirmed in a recent paper by uh, Gerard Anderson in World Psychiatry. So if you a couple of years ago, we did a meta-analysis on self-guided therapy for depression. So there's no coach. Patients just go to the internet and work through all the steps just by their own. And we found by that time seven large trials. The number has uh, more than doubled since then. But the, end, but the effects point in the same direction. And what we find is that we have small effects which last longer than uh, post-test only, uh, but the effects are really much smaller than those of face-to-face -face or guided self-help treatments. Another important issue is who delivers the treatment. And we've, we've looked in a sample of studies whether the treatment was delivered by a professional therapist, by a student who was trained to deliver the treatment, or in uh, the other studies where it was not clear who was the, uh, the, tr the, the, the provider of the treatment. And what we found first is that uh, the student therapist had higher effect sizes than the professional therapists, which is not so strange because student, that we included several small studies based on PhD uh, thesis in which the uh, a PhD student was also the therapist, so they, and the quality was not very high. So if we adjusted for the quality of the uh, study and all the, all the other characteristics, the difference between professional therapists and students was not significant anymore. But still, this shows that um, uh, a professional therapist is not more effective than a student therapist. 
which is not so strange either, because what you find in these studies is that you have protocolized, manualized therapies. The therapists are trained to do it in that way as described in the manual, and they have to adhere to the manual. And this shows that students can do that. Well, that's not so very surprising to me. In the last, in, in one other meta-analysis, we, we only, there we looked only on individual therapies. And what we tried to examine is the treatment intensity. And we looked at that from different angles. We looked at the number of treatment sessions. We looked at the duration of the treatments. But we also looked at the frequency of treatment sessions and the total contact time between a therapist and a patient. And here you see what happens with the number of sessions. What you see is that uh, with an increasing number of sessions, the effect size goes up very little. This was significant, but we, if we adjust it for all the other characteristics of the studies, it was not significant anymore. So there's really no evidence that the number of treatment sessions, that a longer therapy is better than a brief therapy. Um, for the duration of the therapy, we even found an effect size in the opposite direction. So the longer the therapy lasted, the smaller the effect size was. But again, this was not significant anymore after adjustment for all the other characteristics of the studies. What we did find, and that was highly significant, is the number of sessions per week. So, uh, for example, in the CBT manual for depression from Tim Beck, it says that you should give in the first weeks two sessions per week, and afterwards you can uh, have one session per week. But, for example, in the Net Netherlands, that is not common practice. What happens here is that you get one session per week. What we found clearly here is that if you give two sessions, that the effect size is much higher than if you give one session per week. And we uh, use this for, we got funding for a trial to examine this and validate this empirically uh, in a few Dutch mental health care institutes. Okay, what about other outcomes? Uh, for So until now we have only looked at the effects of psychotherapy on depression, depressive symptoms measured with clinician-rated or self-rated depression scales. But does it not have effect on all kinds of other things? So we looked at that in a series of meta-analysis we're conducting now. So surprisingly, we found only a few studies in which the effect on suicidality was measured. So treatments for depression are seldom examined on their effects on suicidality. And basically, we do not know whether if you give psychotherapy for depression, whether that also has an effect on suicidality of the patient. The number of trials is just too small. We do know that if you treat depression successfully, that you also reduce the feeling of hopelessness, which is strongly correlated to suicidality. We have also examined the effects of psychothera psychotherapy for depression on social functioning. And there we also find clear effects, clear indications that that psychotherapy is effective in improving social functioning. In another meta-analysis, we've looked at social support. And again, we find that if you treat depression successfully, you also find effects on social support. In a final study we did, small sample of trials, we examined uh, whether psychotherapy given to mothers of, who are depressed, whether that has an effect on their children. And what we found is that if you treat those, those depressed mothers successfully, that, that has a, a strong or uh, an, a significant effect size on mental health of their children, on the interactions between mother and child, and on parental functioning in general. 
But this was the good news, now the bad news. And I already told you a few things about the problems with this field of research. And uh, I will show you first here what exactly does, what, what, what do we really, uh, what are the real benefits if you look at uh, these studies? Because effect size, as as, you know, it's a statistical thing and it's, what does it, what does it mean for an individual patient? So what we did in this meta-analysis, we just looked at very concrete outcomes. And for example, what you see here is we looked how many patients who have major depression when they start treatment do not have major depression after treatment. And we saw, for example, that if you look at the psychotherapies, about 62% of the patients who have major depression at baseline do not longer have major depression after treatment. That's not, that's good, which you, you think. But if you look at the control groups, so if people go, for example, to only get care as usual instead of the psychotherapy, then uh, about 48% of people do not longer meet criteria for major depressive disorder. So the exact contribution of psychotherapies compared to care as usual is only 14%. And that's not that good. For that individual patient, that's of course important. And it's uh, from a clinical perspective, uh, that's still very important. But it's not, not, not we, we, we should try to do better at least. If you look for example of response in terms of 50% reduction on the level of uh, depressive symptoms, it's, it, it's much better, but it's still only very limited. So 48% of the patients have, uh, do respond, but 19% of the patients in the control groups respond. So there's still only that difference of 0.29, 29%, which can be attributed to uh, the therapy. Publication bias. I all, all already showed you this during the course, but I will show it once again. That if you look at publication bias in this field of uh, psychotherapy research, and you do not adjust for publication bias, you have an effect size of 0.67. But if you do adjust for publication bias, the effect size reduces to 0.42. And we, we've missed dozens of studies in this field. And all other indicators of publication bias uh, clearly indicate that we do have important publication bias and that we overestimate the true effects of psychotherapy considerably. And here again you see the, uh, the funnel plot here without the imputed studies and here with the imputed studies, clearly showing that we have missed quite a lot of studies in our meta-analysis. I all also showed you the relation between effect size and study quality, and that of the 115 controlled studies we included in this meta-analysis, only 11 met all quality criteria. And those high quality studies had a significantly lower effect size compared to the other studies, whatever way you looked at it. So that's very robust uh, finding. We're taking all kinds of new directions now in this field. Uh, I won't go too deep into this, but what, what, we, what we try to do is we look at other outcomes. I already showed you about the outcomes on social support and social functioning, the effects on children. We're also looking at quality of life, etc. We're looking more and more at the long-term effects. We're also starting to publish meta-analysis and build comparable databases on other mental disorders. And we've started with, we have published a meta-analysis on general anxiety disorder, panic disorder, uh, psychotic disorder, and we're working on several more. We're, and we're also collecting the primary data of many of the trials included in our database so that we can so that we can examine moderators of outcome much better so i come to my overall conclusions um, these past 40 years of research on psychotherapy for depression have resulted in 
hundreds of randomized trials and a huge body of knowledge. And we know that psychotherapies are effective in many target groups and settings, that they have comparable effects as pharmacotherapy, and that the combination of pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy is even better. And that if we, uh, that if we look at the longer term, that psychotherapy probably have, has effects which last longer than the therapy itself. But we also have to uh, realize that psychotherapies are effective and are beneficial to many patients, but they're also less effective than we have thought for a long time because of publication bias and the low quality of many of the included studies. Thank you for your attention.